doing? Uh, my name's Stephen Watt. Uh, I've been performing poetry for about five or six years now. Um, so I'll start off with a romantic one. Ruby. I th sorry. <laughs> I wish to solve you. Make it my life's mission. Mixing the colours of your eyes, I consider my options and reassess my direction. By elimination of the vision, I will turn you inside out to make the faces of six past lovers one. You were always the one. I think in squares, everything must be parallel. So many qualities, you're multi-dimensional, a love spell. I've tossed coins into a wishing well to answer the puzzle, but all that is visible is alternative layers, debatable equations. You will always have my patience. Can I split you, turn you into universes and orbits, unpeel the layers to reveal a pyramorphics, diamond fireworks? I empty my pockets and lay a ring on my table, releasing a butterfly chorus which gusts in my stomach, sprinkling like sip stars, and I wait for you with space invaders in my heart. Uh, I've been choosing mostly kind of family themed poems this evening because my poor sod of a dad's come along to listen to me this evening. <laughs> so just to fill in back soon, this one's called My Father. Man of the house, breadwinner, the reek of old spice under his collar like some gunslinger hanging around a piano bar in the American Old West. Yeah, that is the character which typified my dad best. Cigarettes in the top pockets of the clean shirts my mum doggedly ironed, where upturned sleeves exposed biceps Tarzan would find difficult to contest. Dad was simply an electrician in earnest. In childhood film, he was missing, hiding behind cameras and recorders, taking orders and fixing furniture which my sister and I had tortured. I've often wondered how we avoided being murdered, but he loved us. He would play Jaws at the Baths, all threatening cello with sharp moustache because he himself was unable to swim. I died a thousand times because of him. We grew, he shrunk, we both get drunk at my sister's wedding. The only man the reception who knew how to waltz, pretending he was as hopeless as the rest, while I secretly planted miniature malts into his jacket breast. Aunts and uncles befuddled how he became so pissed. And then this, my gran's death, a casket mounted upon a shoulder and the struggling breath of my father on the other side sounding older than ever and I'm no longer able to mask my distress that one day the weight of his absence may crush me. Um, I'm going to do one called Vanilla. Uh, this is about your kind of family holidays to crappy caravan parks and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> Seaside towns were earmarked for family holidays. Rill, Arbroath, Scarborough. Slathered in sun cream despite relentless rain, my mother told us to cut out the complaints and be grateful that the spiders in Spain were nowhere to be seen. It was British holidays for us, leaky caravans, cardigans, reading fishermen magazines. Beaches stretched like White opera cloaks, limousines gleaming with god rays, where a ring of signet wings were speckled like the Milky Way, nesting in the evergreen moss beneath looming limestone cliffs. Hospitable rocks where lovers sat were scrawled with scarlet lipstick, and letters rolled inside of empty wine bottles, pogoed in the devoted arms of starfish. Someone's grubby dog convulsed, shaking gilet sea spray into its repulsed owner's face. We walked, lifting coarse screw seashells to our ears, listening to rhythmic years of ragtime, bebop, crab jazz. In several photographs, a He-Man mask covers my face, jerky videotapes of my skinny, pasty body, swiping at seagulls with a flimsy plastic sword. Taps off and the birds quickly retorted. Neon clouds drew power from the electric sky, dodgems accelerating towards collisions with the awakening seawater. Sand fortresses were invariably under threat from foot soldiers, beach balls, the moon's interchanging temper. The needy tide, a broken lover, leaving and then returning. On clear starry nights peering into the distance, Amsterdam's ruby streetlights are burning. 
My dad said something is better than nothing, as if these holidays were some sort of shortcoming. Sauntering back to our caravan, cones in hand and ice cream, sorry, ice cream dripping, he was assured that the only thing that was bland was this vanilla flavour. Tomorrow we would go swimming, play arcades, savour our childhoods. issues and uh, I've basically just chosen one point to read out of that this evening um, which again keeps on the family theme. I've chosen the uh, Umbrella Nightwood and this is a poem about uh, my grand's dementia. I should point out that under every single poem title there's a helpline number which is attached to several kind of issues whether it's abortion or rape or whatever it may be. So uh, in the very back of the book there's an index of what each of the helpline numbers refer to. So this is Umbrella Nightwood. I hated visiting you. The tapestry of your eyes, blank sundials seeking the light but never recognising. Walls carry our faces, forced grins, crimped inside flaking gold frames, but the names, ah, the names of the boy in a hooded mane, of the girl petting a cat, of the man holding your hand slicing cake in a smart grey suit and red cravat. An armchair holds you like a doll, small as the part you play in your own existence, flinching at each touch from these strangers who mirror bad habits, sawn nails, lip-bitten impatience. It's obvious to me that God keeps no favourites. On our birthdays, cards from you appeared in her mum's handwriting, but she insisted we gave thanks to you, smiling as the whiteness of her lie turned ivory. Bleached tusks which grew as long as an elephant's memory. Kneeling at your feet, I roll on your socks as if you were sweet surrender. Sorry, <laughs> as if you were sweet Cinderella. And I feel the tap of my umbrella <clears throat> on my shoulder. Your little whisper barely manages, Stephen, just enough to make me never want to leave you again. with another local lad who's from Helensburg, it was a kind of a gothic EP, so we've been putting some ideas together, I'll do the spoken word, he does the music, so um, one of the poems that I've written for it is called Dragfoot, and it was after John Sage, the Chillingham torturer, uh, Miss Vizzini, I'm sure you're familiar with such things, being a teacher, I know, so <laughs> I sort of actually know Miss Vizzini in the, the crowd earlier on, I thought, oh god, great one more teachers in here, so um, yeah, smash it. <laughs> So uh, this is about John Sage, who had a, a huge hatred for the Scots and was the man who was supposed to have um, executed William Wallace. A crossroads for a damned soul. Sage's ghost is in another world, where earthworms masticate the bone and hell's flames licks the souls. Like an Athens dusk, spiked barrels tear away the red and peel, and etiolated prisoner skittles are revealed, bats of X-rays inside jackals' beaks. Cages are strapped to bellies, where starved rats nod themselves to liberation, and the hatred intoxicating his veins is fueled by the final breaths of victims, with their limbs ash, thumbs screwed, legs snapped, blood brewed, eyes gorged, backs spiked, faces boiled, bodies diced. At the devil's mile, his carcass swings from a tree where no bird sings and flowers will never blossom. The nearby lake stretches out like swampy fingers grabbing at passing horsemen, and the rotting autumn of every year bleeds the leaves in the trees, makes banshees of the wind. And, um, yeah, I think we're just about there, I think we're playing it there. I'll make this my last one, folks. Um, a couple of friends of mine got married a few weeks ago and they asked me if I would write a poem and read the poem at a wedding and I've declined on a number of occasions to do this but I accepted this time round and I thought, right, will I write something quite serious and sincere or will I write something goofy? So I decided to write both and guess which one they opted for. <laughs> this is Love is a Japanese Martial Art. 
Love is not a card from Hallmark, Moonpig, or Clinton's, a posy of roses and intrigue, of kittens, a weekend in Paris, or a romantic imagination about dancing beneath snowflakes with your soulmate like one of Richard Curtis's soppy films. Love isn't the colour of wine, diamond, champagne, the smell of success or the perfume of rain, a wedding dress or the change of a name after the vows and rings and yodelling bed springs, the advent of balls and chain. Quiet, little, unexpected, it invades the veins, blood, heart undetected like ninjas carrying throwing stars. Love is a Japanese martial art. Leaping, gliding, invisible, it soars over roofs, trees, mountains, impossible to stop. A soul stirring sabotage. Love is a Japanese martial art. Love begins curled like a stone, corkscrewed and then extravagant like an optical illusion. Love walks on water, skiing on the secrets of an avalanche that freezes weaker men's evolution. And from smoke bombs, grenades, toxic gas, shrapnel, acid-spurting tubes, poisonous darts, landmines, sickle and firearms, love is a PIA <laughs> martial art. Yeah, love is a shape-shifting marital art which changes like each season of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Love is a Japanese martial art, just as much as we swear to be eternally faithful to ninjutsu. Ninjutsu, I love you.